So welcome to the first of uh, this afternoon's two keynote speeches. It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who, as you all know, has been one of the driving forces, not just of NHS Expo, but one of the leading drivers of change across the whole of the National Health Service over the last decade, and is a major figure both nationally and internationally. Uh, Bruce is moving on to new roles in the NHS soon, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sir Bruce Keogh, the NHS Medical Director. Bruce. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, and thanks to those of you that have put time aside to come here this afternoon. In the mid to second half of the 1960s, there was a small boy in Africa, I think he was about 11, something of that order of magnitude, and he was sitting on the grass underneath a masasa tree listening to a green and white Philips transistor radio. And there was a program about the National Health Service in England. And that little boy knew he wanted to be a doctor, but was still kind of formulating ideas. And he went in and he spoke to his mum about what that meant, because he realized that he lived in a country that wasn't as modern as England. And his mother explained the National Health Service, and he said, I'd like to work in that health service one day. And if you were to fast forward to now, that was me at the age of about 11. And it's one of the greatest privileges, I think, that I've, I've ever had to just to work in the health service and to fulfill the role that I have. But from where I sit, I see all healthcare systems in the world gripped in a kind of quadruple pincer of increasing demand, escalating costs, rising expectations, differential expectations between politicians, professionals, and the public, and a constrained financial environment. And you might think that that's peculiar to our NHS, but it isn't. The Americans quite clearly don't have enough money to deliver the kind of health service that they want. There isn't enough money in Zimbabwe, and European countries are struggling. So our role in our tax-funded system is simply to provide the leadership, the initiative, the creativity, and the innovation to enable us to meet the expectations of the public and within the, uh, within the constraints of the financial envelope in which we have to work. But there are some specific tensions which pop up from time to time in our healthcare system, some of which are similar to others' healthcare systems and some which aren't. The first, and probably the most prominent at the moment, is the uncertainty around Brexit, the implications that that might have for our health service, for our workforce, for our research, and for our innovation, and for the cost. The second tension which, we, which pops up from time to time is the debate between the amount of money that's available and the ability to deliver quality. Well, I'm reminded of something that David Nicholson said once, which was simply, that if you're trying to maintain quality, and if you're trying to increase productivity, and you have to do that in a constrained financial environment, the thing that enables you to do it is innovation. That is what links the two. We also have debates from time to time which seem to be cyclical between what should the NHS do centrally and what should it do locally. And we never really alight on a perfect solution to that. The next tension that we see is, perhaps this will emerge with STPs, is a tension between the way that the NHS likes to do things and the way that local government likes to do things, given that one has a clear national management structure and the other has a locally uh, democratic accountable system. Then there is the issue of giving people freedom and the tension between freedom and regulation, which essentially boils down to a tension between your ability to trust individuals and individual organizations to deliver the quality of care that's expected um, versus performance management. And I think that's quite an important tension 
particularly if we're to give people the permission to make the changes that they need to make in order to deliver the quality of care that, that we expect. There is also a tension, and this is accentuated when uh, money is tight, about where you invest, whether you invest in prevention or whether you invest in acute care. And that will play out uh, constantly, not just in our healthcare system, but in many's. One of the things that is also a tension in our NHS is the relationship between competition and collaboration as drivers for change. Another tension that we face is the fact that we have more older people than young people in this country. Older people want continuity of care close to home. The younger generation brought up in the post-internet age want immediacy of information and immediacy of access, and they want knowledge um, quickly. And so we have to run parallel and twin tracks to deliver both of those if we're going to cover the aspirations and expectations of the whole population. Another tension which emerges from time to time is a tension between clinicians in the health service and managers in the health service. Not because of any interprofessional tension, but simply because from dif at different times, those two groups work to different sets of goals. And when those goals are aligned, it's a very, very powerful combination. But when they aren't, it can at times be destructive locally. And then the, the final issue that I, I wanted to raise in this is, it's not really a tension, but it's an unfinished debate about whether our NHS is simply a drain on taxpayers' money or whether it contributes to the economy. I think that debate is shifting quite quickly to the fact that investing in the NHS makes good sense for the economy because we employ well over a million people who spend money, who pay taxes. At another level, organizations in our National Health Service buy products made by companies in this country who employ people who pay taxes. And there is some evidence that that makes a, uh, a significant contribution to our economy that far outweighs the cost of our health service. So those are 10 kind of tensions or unfinished debates which I think are largely unique to our healthcare system over and above the quadruple pincer that I alluded to. Now, every day when you pick up the newspapers, turn on the TV, look at social media, you see some criticisms of the NHS. Sometimes it's driven to make party political points. Sometimes it's to promote newspaper sales. Sometimes it's to increase the counter on, um, on online profiles. And sometimes it's simply about competitive exhibitionism on social media. Um, and that can be difficult and challenging for people working in the health service. But you know, it's simply a measure of how the NHS matters to people in this country. And it's an essential part, in my view, of the social debate that needs to take place um, to promote our health service, to develop our health service, and to set aspirations for our health service. But sometimes, in the course of that debate, some pretty inconvenient truths are exposed. And we need to be honest about those and understand them and tackle them. So it can be quite daunting for those people who are trying to promote change in the health service. So let me just give you a bit of confidence. I want you to sit back. It's a kind of second last session of this, um, of this expo. And just, just imagine. Imagine you lived in a country that had made a major contribution to the science of medicine that had discovered the mosquito was a carrier of malaria, that had discovered immunization and vaccination, particularly for smallpox, which is said to have saved more lives than all the lives that have been lost in all the wars that humankind has ever fought. Imagine if that country had also postulated the theory of evolution, had discovered the double helix, had developed the intellectual property, for decoding the double helix, if that country 
had invented or discovered uh, the properties of antibiotics, if that country had developed in vitro fertilization in a district general hospital, which has transformed the lives of families around the world, if it had also developed the ability to stop and start the heart electively, which is the basis of modern heart surgery, you would think they've made a pretty significant contribution. If you also thought that they had developed the technology for cloning the first mammal in Dolly the sheep, you would think they're really getting to the bottom of science. And then, if you thought that country had also invented the clinical thermometer, the intraocular lens, the laryngeal mask, the CT scanner, the MRI scanner, you'd think that's pretty cool. And then, if you thought that country had four of the top 10 universities in the world, had 1% of the world's population, funded 3% of the world's research, produced 6% of the world's medical research papers, and 16% of the highest cited scientific medical papers. You would think that's good. But you might wonder, until you realize that that country also had four of the top 10 universities in the world, and per capita of population, twice as many Nobel Prizes for medicine or physiology than the United States. And also, if that country can regularly rated number two or three in the Global Innovation Index, put together by INSEAD and the World Intellectual Property Organization. Or even if that country had 5,000 life science companies employing 235,000 people with a 64 billion pound turnover, you would think there's some good innovation going on there. Or if 10% of that country's exports were represented by the med tech and pharma industries. So that country would have a real substrate for medical and healthcare innovation. But just imagine if it also had one of the world's greatest social innovations ever achieved. A semi-integrated, free at the point of delivery healthcare service, which saw 440 million people a year in pharmacy, 360 million people a year in general practice, 100 million people a year in outpatients, another 100 million people a year in community services, 23 million people a year in accident and emergency services, 9 million people in ambulance services. You would think if you could, if you could link the science that happened in that country with that population, you would think it's pretty good and a good place to be. Well, folks, we are in that country. And I think that should give us real confidence that we have the opportunity, in my view, to develop the best healthcare system in the world. It will be rocky, but I believe it's only a stone's throw away. There will be people all around the place who will argue, A, about the weight of the stone, and B, about the size of the stone, and C, about who's going to throw it. But I think it is throwable, and I think the goal of a really good health service that's internationally competitive is absolutely achievable. So despite some of the tensions that I described and the quadruple pincer and some of the difficulties which we face, there is a paradox in my view, and that is that it's never been as exciting working in our health service as it is now. It's never been as difficult but I will take you through some of our achievements and indicate to you where I think some of the solutions lie and how, and how we might get there. Over the <clears throat> 10 years or so that I've been medical director of the health service, we've tackled a number of problems. The first one was MRSA that I recall. Now, this was before I became medical director. The Daily Mail were having a go about the number of MRSA cases that were prevalent within our health service on a daily basis. People in the health service didn't like it. John Reed, who was the Secretary of State, didn't like it. He summoned in Christine Beasley, who was the Chief Nursing Officer, and said, sort it out, I want a 50% reduction in MRSA over the next three years. I was working as a cardiac surgeon in Birmingham at the time, and I remember hearing this from my secretary, 
And I thought, what are those guys smoking down there? You know, don't, if they just walk onto our ITU, they'll see elderly people, immunosuppressed patients who have had transplants. Um, it's the price you pay. Don't they understand that? Well, you know, in my job, sometimes it is really nice to be wrong. And I was utterly wrong. Because in 2003-04, there were 7,700 cases of blood-borne MRSA in our country. By 2015-16, that was down to 817 and still falling, a 90% reduction for something that I didn't think could be done, for something that was the methodology was known from the time of Semmelweis 150 years ago, but it took the Daily Mail and an irritated Secretary of State to inject the ambition for us to do what we know that we needed to do. But it was the right thing. Similarly, with trauma, we knew that we weren't delivering trauma services as well as we could. Keith Willett, who was our national clinical director for trauma, was constantly pointing that out, but he came up with good solutions. We ended up with 22 trauma networks with 27 major trauma centers. That meant that some ambulances would have to drive past your local A&E with somebody pretty sick in the back to get to a major trauma center. People cried foul. They said patients would die in the back of the ambulance, that it was a scandal, it was just a cost-saving exercise. Well, in the first year of operation, the odds ratio for uh, very ill patients, the odds ratio for survival went up 15%. In the second year of operation, it went up 30%. And in the third year of operation, the odds ratio for survival for the most severely injured people improved by 50%. So when we put our minds to thing, when there is a professional consensus, and when we have a plan, we can save lives and do real good things for our citizens. Similarly with stroke. When Roger Boyle was the National Clinical Director for uh, Cardiac Services, he had done a fantastic job on organizing cardiac services, and he was asked to, um, to bring the same expertise to stroke. An example of how good this was is in London. There were 32 hospitals that were receiving people with strokes. That made no sense because at the time, the emerging therapies were suggesting that if you got the right patients and you gave them clot-busting drugs, you could dissolve the clots and improve the outcome from stroke. The snag is that if you give clot-busting drugs to people whose stroke is due to bleeding, you make matters worse. So we needed to get people to a place where they could have a quick CT scan to determine what group they fell into and then give them uh, the right treatment. The end result was an agreement to reduce the number of receiving centers from 32 to 8. Again, people cried foul. It was cost-saving. People would die in the ambulances. But in relatively short order, it became clear that the average time from somebody making a telephone call to someone arriving in a hyperacute stroke unit was only 55 minutes in London, and that 40% of people went home within three days. And we had an increased number of people going back to independent living and a reduced mortality. And what's more, the end result of that was tens of millions of pounds saved for reinvestment in health services in London. Again, where there is common clinical consensus on how best to treat people and where there is a solid plan, something good could be achieved. Similarly, with the treatment of major heart attacks, it's a real credit, again, to, um, to Roger Boyle, to Hugh and Gray, our current uh, National Clinical Director for uh, this particular area of heart disease, that 99% of people in this country, wherever you are, will get primary angioplasty for a, for a major heart attack. That is absolutely incredible by international standards. But it gets better because 77% of people will get that within 150 minutes. Their artery will be opened after having made the telephone call. And our hospitals are better organized now at dealing with heart attacks. 
the median time from arrival at the front door to having your artery opened again is 41 minutes. I see people advertising with slower times than that in the United States. It's something we should be really proud of. And then the treatment to prevent people having a subsequent heart attack, I think, beats almost all international standards. 98% of people get antiplatelet agents. 94% of people get angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors to assist with their uh, blood pressure. 97% of people get statins. Something we need to be really proud of. But you know, there's much more to do. What I've illustrated to you is that we know how to treat stroke and heart attacks. But you will have seen today that we've launched a new initiative which simply focuses on prevention being better than cure. And that's been led by our National Clinical Director for Prevention in Cardiac Disease, Matt Kearney. But Public Health England have estimated, and this is their figures, that if we could control blood pressure, cholesterol, and atrial fibrillation in our population, where we know that there are a lot of people who don't know their blood pressures and don't know their cholesterols, that we could probably reduce the number of heart attacks by 9,000 and save 270 plus million pounds a year, or the number of strokes by 14,000 and saving an additional 240,000 a year. So there are significant gains to be made by prevention rather than cure, and that comes back to one of the tensions that I raised right at the beginning about where we invest our money. But let me be absolutely clear that the prize in this is not saving the money. It's saving the lives, but most importantly, saving the human suffering um, that, uh, that attends these uh, very difficult um, vascular instances. One of the things that I'm absolutely keen to get embedded before I leave at the end of the year is a new approach and a solid approach to stroke and we're working very closely with the Stroke Association to, to further develop uh, the prevention agenda that Matt Kearney is leading, but also to focus on new treatments and rehabilitation. Rehabilitation of stroke is not good in our health service. We know what to do. We need to get on and do it. But one of the things that is going to be driving further changes in stroke care is new science and technology because I've already mentioned that you can treat some strokes with clot-busting uh, drugs, but now there is technology to put little grabbers into the artery up through blood vessels in the groin and grab a clot and pull it down, because some clots are so solid that even clot-busting drugs won't deal with them. Now, that is going to require a different workforce. It's going to require a dif different disposition of services. And it will require some difficult discussions with some people delivering stroke services who will have to acknowledge that people will be better treated somewhere else. Dementia, we've made big progress on. Um, again, it wasn't a, an entirely straightforward journey. We've reduced the number of antipsychotic drugs given to um, dementia patients by 50%. But I think perhaps more importantly is we've increased the diagnosis rate in populations from something of the order of 40% to around about 70%. Now you might say, well, why would you do that when you can't yet treat dementia? The really important reason for doing this, and I say this as someone who's watched it in my own family, is that we can give people structured support and their families' structured support and how to deal with the impending consequences of dementia. And we've given that support now to an additional 150,000 people as a consequence of that initiative. But perhaps one of the most important changes that we made, um, and it's important to me personally rather than necessarily the health service, was around venous thromboembolism. Some years ago, there was an all-party parliamentary group who had conducted research along with others to indicate that, well, something like 38,000 people were getting venous thromboembolism episodes in our hospitals. It was estimated then um, that 25,000 of those people uh, were dying as a consequence. Now, it's probably not that much, but at the time, the, um, the evidence seemed relatively clear. 
We put a number of systems in place to ensure that uh, people were assessed for venous thromboembolism when they came into hospital and that they got the appropriate treatment if they were at a high, high risk. But I learned something really important from that. Once again, a bit like John Reed and MRSA, much of the ambition was driven by political colleagues. That was the first thing. The second thing is that when it came to actually delivering it, um, there was an interesting discussion um, where the president of the Royal College of Surgeons stood up and um, said to me, why don't you mandate venous thromboembolism assessment when people come into hospitals? He said, I did my research on venous thromboembolism 40 years ago and nothing's changed. And I gave the answer that I kind of alluded to at the beginning of this talk. I believed in clinical freedom. I believed in uh, local control over the way you delivered your services and so forth. And it was a bit waffly, frankly, the answer. And then the president of the Royal College of Physicians stood up and said, yeah, why don't you mandate it? And I kind of repeated the answer in slightly different words. And as I walked back um, to my office, I thought, what's going on in our NHS where leaders of the medical profession are turning to me and saying, force us to do what we know we need to do? And then suddenly the penny dropped. That wasn't what they were asking. They were saying, we know what we need to do, but make the system help us do what we need to do. And this is the fundamental basis of safety, is how we make it difficult for people to do the wrong thing and easy to do the right thing. And so we learned a lot about change there, that if we did the change through the colleges and the specialist associations and clinical groups, who knew about venous thromboembolism, coupled with patient groups and parliamentary groups that understood some of those issues. And we, in the Department of Health, put the appropriate financial and other incentives into the system. We could do massive change. And within a year, the assessment rate for venous thromboembolism went up from under 40% to over 90%. In my view, one of the fastest clinical changes that, um, that I've seen in the NHS. Something else that I'm very keen to have firmly embedded before I leave is our response to sepsis. Now, sepsis, for those of you that don't, haven't seen it uh, regularly, is the body's response to a severe infection. It can be absolutely catastrophic. It's tricky because it masquerades as many things, so it can be difficult to diagnose. And the catch is that if you don't diagnose it quickly and treat it quickly, then bad things happen. So, in 2015, under the leadership of uh, Celia Ingham Clark, um, we published a strategy for helping organizations help clinicians diagnose and treat sepsis early. That plan has been very effective. We've seen in accident emergency departments a proportion of people who are assessed for uh, sepsis going up from 50% to um, 87%. We've seen the timely treat um, administration of antibiotics going up from just under 50% to uh, 62%. More recently, we've introduced the same incentives into the hospital, and we've started to see similar uh, improvements. That pretty well everything that we put into that plan has now been done. And I'm sure um, you will be hearing over the next 24 hours of a new set of things that we propose to do in order to tackle sepsis, where there is common cause among the clinical professions and patient groups that that is a serious uh, condition which we can treat easily if we, um, if we set ourselves the task. Now, there are a number of new things on the horizon. Firstly, we have new drugs. Secondly, we have mobile technology. Thirdly, we have artificial intelligence. Fourthly, we have genomics. And fifthly, we have general purpose technologies being developed in other industries which will have an impact on, um, on the NHS, but we don't quite see it yet. And I'll just deal with that first. I'm told from reliable sources 
that changes in superconducting technology mean that handheld MRI scanners will be less than a decade away. I was told that two years ago. Now, I don't know anything about superconducting technologies, but it, is, it illustrates that we need to be really aware of what's going on in the world around us. Secondly, we've seen a lot about the potential for 3D printing, which has been developed in other industries and is being used in other industries. But when you couple that with the Internet of Things, you can see how it can bring some distributive solutions to, um, to some of the problems that are facing healthcare around the world. And today, at the Tevis stand, I saw 2D printing. I thought, so what's so new about that? Because isn't that what we've been doing for years? Well, 2D printing of drugs onto very thin strips of, of plastic where the drug can simply be peeled off and stuck on your tongue. I think that's a, uh, a novel development, and we'll just have to see how, um, how that gets taken up. Now, new drugs um, are really exciting. I was speaking to um, someone in a, in a major pharmaceutical company who used to be a professor of medicine in this country. He said, you know, at the moment, he said, we only have three groups of drugs which actually cure people. He said, the first is antibiotics. The second is a collection of drugs for treating childhood uh, leukemias. And the third is a new set of drugs for treating hepatitis C. Well, you can argue about the detail of that, but the principle is quite clear that most drugs we give alleviate symptoms, make people feel better, but only a limited number of drugs we give actually cure people. But there's a whole bunch of new drugs coming over the horizon now that do cure people. But they're very focused. They need to be given to exactly the right person, which means the cohorts of patients will be relatively small, which means the recovery of R&D costs will be tricky, which means the cost of these drugs is going to be very high. So one of the things that we have to do, I believe, for the degree of urgency over the course of the next couple of years is engage the pharmaceutical industry in new ways of paying for drugs rather than simply a click counter where we pay per tablet. We're going to have to be quite imaginative in this, and it, it'll take us into very, uh, very interesting territory, I think. Now, mobile technology is we use in every other part of our lives. We run our social lives, our financial lives, our travel lives, our retail lives online. But have you tried booking a hospital appointment online, getting a GP appointment online, getting your blood results online? seeing your x-rays online or on your mobile phone. We're not really there yet, are we? And we should be. And frankly, it's coming whether we like it or not. So I think we need to, we need to welcome the potential change, but we need to recognize that it brings with it some particular challenges. It also seems to me that there are two particular areas that we need to think about when we're thinking about mobile technology. The first is digital therapy, particularly in the area of mental health and talking therapies. There will be things that you can do on your phone that will make you better so that you don't have to visit a psychologist or a psychiatrist or your GP. We need to work out how we assess those, but importantly, we also need to work out the payment mechanisms behind them so that they are available for people on the National Health Service. The second area that this whole mobile technology will open for us is that as the internet shrinks the world, as we become far more interconnected, we have to ask what the impact on our society, on our NHS is going to be when people can get advice and treatment from people outside normal geographical boundaries. At the moment, the way our health service is structured, you visit your GP who's determined by where you live. But people are already visiting GPs outside the area where they live. What happens as they increasingly start to access health care, not just beyond their local area, but beyond their regional area and possibly internationally? We need to work out what the compact is with the citizen 
under those kind of circumstances with particular respect to the NHS? Who pays for what? What the duties of government and arm's length bodies are with respect to ensuring the safety of those transactions? What are the legal implications? And how do we, how do we make this part of the NHS rather than create a kind of two-tier, pay for it if you can, service. And I think that will take us into some very interesting um, transactional and regulatory territory. But we shouldn't shy away from it because the opportunities, I think, are, are absolutely huge. Now, when you think of mobile technology, that's one thing. But when you think of the potential of coupling it with artificial intelligence, it takes us into a whole new arena. We know from a number of studies that have been done, in certain circumstances, artificial intelligence is better than doctors at diagnosing certain conditions. That's the first point. The second point is that it's possible that certain types, and there are many different types of artificial intelligence, will be able to read x-rays. Um, I've been told by uh, reliable people who are developing this sort of stuff that that's within a four-year time frame. We also know that this kind of um, approach can be used for reading histopathology slides. So all of this takes us into very new territory. And it's not a long way over there. It's actually here now. And so we, as a group, we as a, as a society, as people um, intimately involved in the National Health Service, we really need to think about the implications um, of that. And I'll, I'll come back to it uh, in a minute. Now, over the years, I've been kind of watching the progress of molecular biology and genomics. Um, and there have been many false dawns. I've sat on various committees over the last 20 plus years where people have said, it's here. It's going to completely transform medicine. Be ready. It's coming tomorrow. Well, it never did. But now I'm in that position of saying to you, I think it is here. And the reason I say that I think it's here is that some years ago, it took a couple of years, or cost, took the best part of a decade, and cost a couple of billion dollars to sequence a human genome. That cost has now plummeted to well under $1,000, depending on the granularity, maybe somewhere around three, 400 quid. And it takes less than 24 hours. Now, that is a massive step change, which suddenly opens up the, the whole vista and promise of understanding a human genome. And this country leads in that technology. It leads in the, in the ability to read the human genome. It reads in many areas, it leads in many areas of, of genomics. But one of the reasons it leads is because we have a 100,000 genome project which aims to sequence 100,000 genomes uh, in relatively short order. And we've done very well on that with rare diseases. We found it far more difficult in cancer because of the heterogeneous nature of cancer samples and the difficulty of ensuring that you're getting uh, the right sample. But we will crack that, and we will continue to lead the world. And it has led to some pretty interesting developments in the disposition of our laboratory services, which we are cu currently reorganizing and, and re-procuring. But genomics offers to us not just the ability to treat individuals with greater precision, it offers us some public health opportunities. Because as we increasingly understand the impact of genetics on the inheritance of disease and the predisposition to disease and the relationship between your genetic uh, makeup and your environment, we will increasingly be able to predict those patients who might suffer from particular conditions. And in time, we might be able to pick that up very early on in life, which means we will be able to prevent or delay certain conditions happening. So prediction, prevention, and precision treatment are the prize, I think, uh, that genomics offers us. Now, all of these are very transformative uh, technologies. They will, they will mean that we will have to reimagine 
the way that we design our services, the way we staff our services, and the way we train our staff. This has been true in other industries, and it's going to be true in health. And we've been quite good at that over the years, but I think the necessity for these changes will be accelerated by the advent and, and uptake of technology. And in a sense, that's why we're all at Expo. You will have been around Expo and you will have seen that we have the infrastructure for tackling some of these problems. We have our academic health science networks, which promote innovation and economic growth, which are broadly speaking around um, fairly cohesive groups of patients of about five million. The opportunities that patient groups that size offer to providers, commissioners, people interested in healthcare and other industries to innovate is absolutely huge. Now, I won't go through the benefits that the academic health science networks have, have bought over the last uh, three years or so, but I would suggest you, you visit the stand because some of the, uh, the things that have been achieved are pretty impressive. Similarly, we have the Small Business Research Initiative, um, which through funding of about 20 million a year, promotes new and emerging companies and helps them tackle some of the IP issues that new companies have to deal with and route to market and helps them to expand. And we've seen some very innovative um, developments in that space. We also, more recently, have developed something called the National Innovation Accelerator, which takes on 20, has about 25 fellows at the moment who are working on new products and new innovations. The result of that program, which helps them uh, expose their innovations to the NHS, is that over 700 NHS organizations have taken on um, their innovations. They've won 20 awards. 12 of their innovations are selling uh, internationally. And a conservative estimate is that those innovations have brought over 12 million pounds worth of savings to our health and social care system. Another example of the power of innovation in helping us tackle the, the particular difficulties which we face in terms of maintaining quality in the face of constrained finances. Similarly, um, under Tony Young, our clinical director for innovation, we now have a new training system for young doctors, which will be expanded into other professions. I was quite frankly, um, a couple of years ago, shocked to hear a story about two young surgeons who had tried to develop a, a system which would enable you on tablets, iPads, to practice surgery. And it seemed to me I never had the benefit of that when I was trying to learn surgery. And they increasingly got investment, their idea got traction, and they were taken aside by the dean responsible for their training and said, you can't work for the NHS and pursue this endeavor which um, involves uh, running a company. And yet they were doing it in their own time. I think that was really short-sighted. Actually, it was wrong. And so all credit uh, to Tony Young um, and Jackie Hayden, another postgraduate dean, who developed a new training system which will enable young doctors, young nurses in time, and others who want to pursue an innovative entrepreneurial career at the same time as pursuing their training. Now, we now have 103 clinical entrepreneurs who get excellent mentorship from people who are established entrepreneurs themselves. They cover over 110 innovations, and we have evidence that 34 junior doctors who had either left the NHS and returned or were planning to leave the NHS are now back in the NHS. And I think that's a very important achievement, Tony. Well done. On top of that, to support those innovations, they've attracted just under 50 million pounds worth of private funding. We also have agents for change. One of the things that has exercised me is that in our NHS over the years, we have not 
used, we have not exploited the creative spirit, the altruism, the energy of our young junior doctors and nurses. And I found myself asking, what other industry will take people between the mid-20s and the late 30s and just tell them to get on with stuff, but not suck them dry for their ideas? People who are at their most creative time of life. So the other bit that worried me about this is nurses move from ward to ward in institutions. They know which are the good wards and which aren't. They know where the good things are and where the bad things lurk. Why don't we use them in our organizations as agents for spreading change? And similarly, with young doctors, they see stuff, but they move from institution to institution. We should be using these young people as our biggest agents for change in the health service, because not only do they see where good things are and bad things are, they also are creative and they are also uh, innovative. On top of that, we have some really quite dramatic uh, innovative changes happening in our health service. Malcolm Grant is um, leading a new towns initiative. There are 10 new towns which are being developed in England, which give us an opportunity, as Simon Stevens has said on many occasions, to put health right into the center of our new towns. Urban planning was originally about promoting public health and the well-being of our citizens. We kind of dropped the ball a bit on that from time to time, particularly when you look at some of these high-rise places that are now being pulled down. Our opportunity to put some of the technology that we see in this hall into the walls and buildings of our new towns to help people live more healthy lives would be absolutely fantastic, and I think this is a program really worth watching. Similarly, we have seven areas of the country where through competition, we've asked um, industry to help us solve some very specific problems, which are not just unique to those particular communities, but actually prevail across the NHS. And some of those companies are household names, and we're starting to see some very real and tangible benefits, both in terms of improving the quality of care in those communities and also reducing cost. Similarly, with our new models of care program, particularly um, in the vanguards, we've seen the, that we've been able to stimulate the desire for people to change the way services are delivered, to help them do that, and where appropriate, we're looking at reducing the regulatory treacle that so many people are familiar with, which seems to be invisible. Now, in that context, I've found myself asking, and you now might think I'm smoking something, but what would Nye Bevan do if he came back? Well, I think he would look at our health service, and he would think when, when the health service was set up in 1948, it was very different. We didn't have antihypertensive drugs, we didn't have antibiotics, we didn't have anti-cancer agents. You know, the therapies available were pretty limited. The life expectancy of an average male was about 65 years, so half the population didn't reach retiring age. And yet now, what he would see is an array of treatments, which is growing. He would see a population with a male life expectancy now of over 80 years, so an additional 15 years of life that people have to fill compared with the advent of the NHS. And he would see that those people live on a normal physiological spectrum, just like anybody in this room. At one end of the spectrum, there are people who require quite intensive medical therapy. At the other end of the spectrum, there are 80-year-olds who cycle around, walk their dogs, and don't need any help. But most people in that kind of age spectrum sit somewhere in the middle. They need a bit of treatment, or they need a bit of support. And yet, the way we deliver that treatment and provide that support, there is a massive financial, bureaucratic, administrative, and philosophical fracture right in the middle of a normal human physiological spectrum in the sense that we have the NHS over here, which treats sick people. 
and we have the local authorities that provide preventive um, activities and social services over here. The funding mechanisms are different, the philosophies are different, and yet the people are on a normal spectrum. So, what's the solution? The solution is to bring all parties together, put them in a room. I put it to you that STPs are exactly the mechanism for doing that. They're here to ensure that the people responsible for prevention of disease, the people responsible for the treatment of disease, and the people responsible for providing support for people who don't need hospitalization are all in the same room talking about how to deliver joined up services, about how to find economies of scale, and about how to deliver the best services. That, in my view, is the raison d'etre uh, for the STPs. But ultimately, healthcare is about people. The metaphor that I've used in the past is that it's two people in a room, in a private consultation, where one person is frightened, anxious, in pain, worried, and the other person is offering them help. Now, that is a metaphor because I've just told you that it might not be a room, it could be a mobile phone. But everything that we do, whether it's the way we design our real estates, whether it's the way we run our HR processes, whether it's um, our contracting arrangements, all of those processes are simply there to ensure that the person seeking help in that room has an encounter that is safe, effective, and as decent as possible. And everything else that we do should be subservient to that objective. So, I've indicated to you that I think we have great opportunity. People outside the health service can comment on it, but only people inside the health service can actually change it. And the intellectual property of the people that work in the health service is where the solutions to our problems lie. And we need to, we need to expose that and give people freedom to make the changes that they need to. That, those changes need to be fueled by enthusiasm. We need to be absolutely clear that we get the balance between performance management, regulation, and top-down stuff right so that we don't stifle innovation but that we allow it to flourish from the bottom up. I was at a hospital in Worthing um, with uh, Lauren Hughes from uh, my team, where we saw an enthusiastic ward manager called Pete, who every day goes into work and does a safety huddle and a quality huddle on the ward with all the staff just focused on how in that ward they can improve the quality of care that they offer. And it's that sort of commitment, that sort of enthusiasm that really drives the quality of care and keeps the compassion in our health service. So I guess my final message is that we have to trust the people who deliver the services. We need to set some expectations that we expect them to pursue quality and not be frightened of change, but we need to give them the permission and the space to innovate. Thanks very much.